And now, please welcome Media Programs Lead, Ann Pellegrino. Hello, hello. Good morning. Uh, what a fantastic session we've had so far. Uh, thank you, Inbal, for that excellent presentation on the really impactful work that NASA Harvest is doing. My name is Anne, and I lead Planet's Media and Think Tank program. Our mission is to put Planet data into the hands of analysts and reporters, enabling them to shed light on events around the world. During our next conversation, you will hear from members of that community, including our moderator, Jeff Brumfield, a senior editor and correspondent on NPR's Science Desk, and panelists Matt Feiner, Senior Research Specialist and Director of MOP at Amazon Conservation, Meg Kelly, Senior Visual Forensics Reporter at The Washington Post, and Dr. Jeffrey Lewis, a professor and expert at the Middlebury Institute. Let's give them a warm welcome to the stage. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Well, it's great to be up here with you guys today. Um, we represent a, a variety of different stakeholders. Gosh, I've always wanted to say stakeholders in DC. Um, the nonprofit sector, Meg here is a, a journalist, and of course, Jeffrey is a, an academic. And um, I think we'll just kick this off, actually, with a brief discussion of some of the work they've been doing. Um, we'll start with Matt. Um, you've, you've been working, uh, well, tell us a little bit about your organization and then, yeah, we can talk about this work you've been doing in the, in the Amazon uh, rainforest. So I'm lucky enough to work for an organization that we focus exclusively on the Amazon. That's what we do all day, every day. And really since 2013, have really been helping pioneer this use of satellite imagery for real-time monitoring of the Amazons and really turbo boosted in 2016 with the emergence of a planet on the scene. And so the, the sort of thing that we're gonna, I think highlight today is this, this work you've done in Venezuela on detecting illegal gold mining. Um, tell, just sort of walk us through it a little bit. So I think our, and our session is transparency to help expose crisis. And I, I apply the, the term crisis um, very rarely. And, and I think when I do talk about a crisis in the Amazon, I think the best example now is, is illegal gold mining, just for a little context that is now impacting nearly all nine countries of the vast Amazon biome. And we really started working on this issue in the southern Peruvian Amazon, which is one of the poster childs of really just rampant uh, illegal gold mining. And I like to say this, whether it's totally true or not, but we were one of the real early power users of Planet in 2016, 2017, 2018, to really to using Planet to really um, track and monitor, but also just show the world this gold mining this illegal gold mining crisis, and I actually used that word, uh, you know, back in 2017, 2018. And in 2019, the Peruvian government ultimately did launch a major intervention. And now what's interesting is even looking at the images now from April, just yesterday, that main crisis zone that the Peruvian government targeted stopped. So it was an active gold mining expansion front that was just, I, it was like a giant caterpillar that was eating primary forests. And it's been stopped now for four years. So really now we're trying to replicate that. Now there has been some leakage around there, so it's not like a perfect success story, but it's pretty good. Um, and now we're really trying to replicate that example all over the Amazon. We're now actively working in not only Peru, but Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil, and most recently in, in Venezuela, and just to, to emphasize this case, what you can see is this is a this is in a national park in the core of the Venezuelan Amazon, and they ha just rising out of the the Amazon, you have these magical or majestic um, tepuis, which are these sacred tabletop mountains. But basically, as you can see, there's gold mining around the tepui, but actually on top of the tepui. Uh, so we really used planet to document this expanding gold mining 
deforestation not only around the Tapui but on top of it and uh, and and also uh, coupling planet with SkySat. So with SkySat actually being able to document the actual mining camps and and actual pieces of mining equipment on top of of that Tapui. And so one thing led to another. We did the analysis, published our reports. The Washington Post picked it up, and it actually did lead to a government intervention, not on top of the Tapui, I don't think, um, but in the areas surrounding. And again, it wasn't a perfect intervention, but it was a start. And so now we are continually monitoring. A little plug, I am gonna walk through this example in much more detail at, I have a lightning talk at around 2.15, I think today, so I'm really gonna walk through that example. But really just those plan, it was our main tool to, to document this illegal mining, get it out there to the press in, in really all the examples that we're tracking across the Amazon. So that's a great example of sort of a remote location that's hard to get to. Uh, Meg has been working on areas of the world that you just may not want to be in or can't get into because they're not safe. And so, yeah, let's talk about your your story here of using planet imagery for uh, looking at human rights violations. Yeah, um, so the team that I work on in the post uses open source intelligence of all types, but that includes satellite imagery. And most often we find ourselves using satellite imagery, um, as Jeff said, in, in cases where we can't get there. Uh, it's, the country won't let us in, the reporters wouldn't be safe going there. Um, it's not accessible to uh, foreign reporters There's and possibly not even accessible to local reporters. Um, this area of Tigray is the perfect example of that. Um, there were lots of reports that we heard anecdotally um, that as the Eritrean forces were retreating, um, around the time of the peace deal uh, at the end of uh, October and early November that there were these massacres and there were reports after reports but nothing that seemed confirmable and nothing that we could totally pin down um, and so we ended up using geolocation along with sort of traditional reporting methods and satellite imagery specifically SkySat in this case um, to really confirm and show what had happened. So the, the image that um, is on the screen now is a map of all of the burned houses that we were able to identify. So we had reports that they had torched some houses, but you're able to see it in the satellite imagery to sort of show the roofs are gone, you know, the structures are destroyed. And, and oh, sorry, go ahead. No. no, go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. And I think that that sort of gets at the point of what something where, you know, our reporter couldn't get near there for weeks um, she couldn't even get a visa at that point to get into Ethiopia. Um, and so we were able to do this based on a combination of using sort of traditional reporting methods with open source um, data. Yeah, I mean, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, we were talking just before the session, one thing that was really striking is reporters couldn't get in, they were getting a lot of information out on WhatsApp and, and sort of through messaging services. I think the, the imagery both of this and you, you found some military vehicles nearby really help bolster those those eyewitness accounts that were being told remotely. So um, we'll just go on down the line here to Jeffrey, uh, who has been looking at nuclear missile silos under construction in China. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. At the Middlebury Institute, I work at a research center and we study nuclear weapons. And so if you tell someone at a cocktail party that you study nuclear weapons, you get one of two responses. One is that their drink is suddenly empty and they need to go refill it and you will never see them again. <laughs> uh, or they're deeply confused because they want to know, like, how do you study something like that? Because it's supposed to be secret, right? We're not supposed to know about these things. And I think the funny thing about what we do and I think what links that to this case study is um, these things actually aren't all that often secret to the governments involved. Like, I don't think the United States government was unaware that China was constructing uh, large numbers of silos for missiles. Uh, but those of us on the outside, right, often don't have that kind of information. Uh, and so civil society doesn't always have uh, a voice in what are, I think are really important policy debates about uh, you know, fundamental life and death matters. Uh, so this is uh, a particular case study where um, we had gotten some indications that China was expanding its missile force, um, and we wanted to look for evidence of that. Um, 
Certainly the Chinese were not going to let us drive around central China taking photographs of sensitive missile facilities. Uh, and Planet was kind of the perfect partner for this. Because, you know, I think a lot of the work that people do in my field focuses on high resolution imagery. And people have this idea that the sharper the picture is, the better it is. And often we find that's not necessarily true, that there are other really important qualities like having wide coverage of areas and getting that coverage frequently updated, something that actually I think the US government probably underinvested in for a really long time. Um, and so we have this basic signature, which is when the Chinese build missile silos, they put up these giant inflatable domes. Like if you have kids, your kids would play soccer in. Um, and so we were able to use uh, Planet's three meter data, uh, which covers all of China really frequently uh, in order to mount a search to see if we could find any of these domes. And my, my colleague, Decker Eveleth, uh, he's actually the person who did the, the hard, hard work of going uh, square kilometer by square kilometer through China and ultimately stumbled upon much more construction than we ever imagined. I think he found the first 120 of what's going to turn out to be something like 300 new missile silos, which just to put that in perspective for you, you know, this is a, this is a nuclear force that currently is about uh, 100, you know, ICBMs that can hit the United States. So a really potentially significant expansion. Yeah, although I guess you, you were, there's still some debate about what they're putting in those silos, right? Or if they're... Yeah, so this is actually, I think, the reason that civil society becomes so important, right? We've, we've heard this idea that transparency leads to accountability. And so when you see a really big expansion like this, one question is, well, why are they doing this? Um, and you know, our sense is that, at least within the United States government, there was a strong sense that China is going to put a missile in every single silo. And if they do that, that is a giant expansion. Uh, those of us on the outside uh, think that the way that the silos are laid out looks much more like an old US idea to put one missile and sort of shuffle it among a larger number of silos. Mm. So instead of 300, it might be 30. We don't know who's right, but I think the point is that this is an incredibly important debate that we have to be having because which of those two cases it turns out to be is gonna be really consequential for the choices we make in terms of our nuclear deterrent relationship with China. So um, you'll notice these have all been Washington Post stories. I, I feel obligated to put an NPR. <laughs> image up on the stage. Uh, and, and I'll just note that we we report on sub 30 centimeter imagery. We're proud of that. So <laughs> sorry, that was a terrible resolution joke. Wasn't it? <laughs> all right. All right. Moving on. Moving on. Um, so I, I think I wanted to sort of shift the conversation. I think one of the things that has really changed uh, the game for, for this sort of work is the war in Ukraine. I know remote imagery has, has been around. People have been working with it for years. Um, certainly uh, the Syrian conflict, I think we saw sort of a lot of use of it as well. It's nothing new, but, but Ukraine has really moved the needle. And I wondered if, um, I don't know, maybe we'll start with Jeffrey, since you, you were sort of looking at the stuff at the beginning of the war. What, how do you think having sort of commercial imagery has changed the way we perceive the war? I, I think our interaction with this war is utterly unlike any other interaction we've ever had. I mean, I'm old enough to remember how bizarre people thought it was that the first Gulf War in 1991 was televised. Right? And, and we can actually kind of doom scroll through this war on our phones, which I think is a profound and, and fundamental change. I think satellite imagery is a crucial component of that. Um, and it, it's crucial right from the beginning because there was this enormous debate about whether Russia was or was not going to invade. Um, and I find it really interesting that the Biden administration was very deliberate in both the release of commercial satellite imagery, but also I think in saying things that allowed those of us who work with commercial satellite imagery to verify that what they were saying was, was true. And we almost had these two different ways of knowing. Right? So I, I have a lot of people that I have a lot of respect for who are, uh, you'd call them sort of Russia hands, and, and they have a traditional way of knowing which is talking to people in Russia and getting a sense of what's going on. And that is very important and we should never neglect that. 
But in this particular case, Putin seemed to keep that decision so tightly um, that people who followed Russia in that traditional way couldn't really see the invasion. Those of us working with satellite imagery, whether it was optical imagery or radar imagery, uh, could see this giant ring of steel and death that was being amassed along Ukraine's border. And so that new way of knowing, I think, gave us a much more accurate and timely sense uh, of what was about to happen. Meg, I mean, you and I have both been involved in reporting on Ukraine um, from afar. Um, I mean, what do you, what's sort of your view on how it's changed reporting on the conflict? I think that um, there's sort of two ways that having this sort of proliferation of commercially available satellite imagery and satellite companies that are willing to share their images with people like us, right? Um, one is that it sort of becomes a daily reporting tool. So a time that for me, that was very true was with Bucha. Um, we had imagery coming out. We wanted to figure out when things happened, when the forces were retreating, when people were massacred. And being able to use satellite imagery to not only like geolocate some of what we saw within um, the videos, but then also to be able to put it in a timeline and say, okay, well, I can see this in the three meter imagery and now I can see this in the sky sat. And okay, I don't see it here. So that gave us a sense and built out sort of the timeline and the understanding of what happened when um, and how quickly the Russians withdrew as part of that. Um, the other place I would say that it's, it's different, I think we've talked about this a little bit, is that the images are now kind of stand on their own. I think you think about the Mariupol Theater, for example, um, and, and that image. The Mariupol Theater being this very striking satellite image of a, of a theater with children written across the front and back parking lots yeah. to deter an airstrike. And then, and then that theater was later struck by the Russians. Sorry. Right. No, 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 no. Oh, thank you. I, these that. things are so like real in my brain that sometimes I forget they're not as real in everyone else's brain. Um, but with the Mariupol Theater, I, I think that image itself sort of became the story, right, in a way that um, satellite images might have described or supported a story in the past. Now I think they really shape both or can shape both reporting processes and also um, the narratives themselves. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I, I feel is that the, um, the imagery has really helped with the deluge of other information we've gotten about the war. So for example, you know, I was at home one night when all of a sudden I get a call from my editors and actually I think I was already on the live stream of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, but the, as the Russians attacked it, someone was had, had put the security camera on YouTube. You could sit there and watch it for four hours as the Russians were attacking the, the nuclear plant. We were able to geolocate the exact position of that camera very quickly, which really helped us verify the authenticity of that footage like basically in real time. Yeah. Um, and I think that that has been so, so important for so much of this stuff because, you know, the footage was grainy. There was no reason to necessarily believe it was real. Right. Um, but but with, with satellite imagery as a reference, I feel that's also become a really powerful tool for us. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you've, you've thought about, I know your work is in other parts of the world. Yeah, yeah I can't directly um, talk specifically about Ukraine, but I do, it is interesting because we are in a bit of a, a different bubble with the, the environmental bubble. And we spend a lot of time trying to convert what we're seeing in the imagery and the data um, to make it very accessible to the public, to policymakers, to journalists. So it was interesting that I have been in this, this bubble. We invest a lot of time really trying to get our maps right with the legends right and the, the captions right. And the, I, I've noticed like, if you don't do those things right, you can have a great map or an image, and, but it gets lost. And so it just been, has been very interesting seeing um, um, satellite imagery being that high profile and, and, and seeing it in, in you know, major papers and, and websites and really trying to learn from other folks that are now taking imagery, looking you know, from a fresh perspective and, and showing how do you make this image speak without having like to read a lot of stuff and go through a detailed legend. And so it's just been very informative for me to try to like take just like the visual, the, the, there's the data part and then there's how you visualize it. And so just really kind of studying how other folks are visualizing this stuff and then trying to apply it to mm -hmm. what we're doing in the Amazon. Yeah, definitely. I mean, 
I've actually been really struck as well by, um, I guess I'd say the public's willingness to like squint at this imagery. Yeah. <laughs> like it's thing. not, yeah, it's not always the most visually exciting. And you start to learn, yeah, how do you minimize that work in terms of arrows and circles or a million different things, but there's a lot that goes into how you visualize that image that I don't think a lot of folks think about, but yeah, but you can learn seeing other folks doing it kind of out of your bubble. Yeah, yeah, and people want to see it. I mean, that's the thing. I think it gives a real sense of authority and authenticity to, to stories often to have a satellite image. I mean, I worry sometimes that the public overestimates actually the capabilities of satellites and the stories they can tell. Um, I think as journalists who understand it a little bit, I don't know how you feel about that, Meg, but. No, no, I, I think that's a fair point. And, and to um, Jeffrey's point about sort of doom scrolling through a war, I do think that satellite imagery kind of gives a touchstone of like, this is real, this is not real, this is potentially a, you know, a piece of 